Call is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. Content warnings for this episode include complex and complicated relationships, heights, interpersonal tension, romance, and references to storms. Arc 1, Episode 8 Turns Hearts to Spite From Self-Eulogy of a Martyr by Connie Chong By size alone, Storm Chaser is a standard issue verdancy ship, a 100 foot long junk that can easily carry five to 10 wild sailors with a maximum capacity of double that number. By all other measures, nothing about Storm Chaser is standard issue. It has a sleek, frame, winnowed and efficient, a far cry from the sturdy craftsmanship of other naval vessels docked at harbor. Its hull is made of exile's copper, a rare, lightweight material typically seen on racing ships, while every other naval vessel is carved from ordinary broadwood. Storm Chaser's copper siding shines in the low light of the evening sun, splotches of blue-green patina resembling algae blooms. As for its bite, its motive force, the way it cuts through the vast canopy of the Verdancy, we see voltaic runners, magnetic outboard contraptions that crackle with barely contained lightning. The ship hovers above the rustling waves at harbor, held there by an invisible force between science and magic. A central mast protrudes from the broad wood deck, topped by a flat strut with thin copper wire strung all the way down the pole. Storm Chaser has definitely seen better days, but it's not hard to imagine the splendor it once had. It hovers now at the edge of Siren Song's harbor, its reef iron railings coated with a thick film of dust. Your party stands on the docks, taking in your new home for the next who knows how long. Queen Hylian Mylesia stands beside you, exuding her usual regal presence. Curious wild sailors and civilians gawk at your party, but the queen's refined aura keeps the onlookers at bay. She steps forward, regarding Storm Chaser with a touch of, what is that, nostalgia? Something soft and old comes over the queen's face. She extends a hand, and she brushes her fingers along the blue-green patina of the copper hull. And then she collects herself, turns, and addresses your crew. This is Storm Chaser and she will be on loan to your crew until your quest is complete. Storm Chaser is a reliable ship, mostly. She hasn't seen action in some time, but she is all we have. As you know, our naval junks are all currently in commission. She was built to be a pathfinding ship, so you'll find a reinforced engine room and an array of wilds clearing tools that will aid you in your mission. I have also taken the liberty of outfitting Storm Chaser with amenities for your particular objective. And at that, the queen lowers her voice to a whisper, so no one else in the harbor can hear what comes next. You will find emergency medicine for the most common ailments of the waves, a photoscope, for detecting distress flares, an isolation room for more serious injuries, and a survival station with flares, flags, grapples, and should you need it, emergency rations. Then the queen leans back and raises her voice again to her normal volume. You will also be pleased to find luxury quarters, five in total, for you to claim and decorate as you wish. That central mast up there with the wiring is an observation deck. The copper lines provide a live feed to the steering wheel. There is also a bank of shutter lamps by the prow so you can signal to other vessels across great distances if need be, though a proficiency in the language is required to make any use of them. Finally, there is an outrider in the chassis of the prow. As for the armaments, 
Yes, Storm Chaser is equipped with a powerful bow-mounted storm rail. And at that, the queen points toward the front of the ship, where you see two huge brass rods wrapped with pretty poorly insulated cables that run somewhere below deck. And these rods seem to have some kind of steering system attached to them, so they can kind of manually swivel a full 600, not 600, 360 degrees upon a rotating base. And the queen just kind of goes on to say, be careful. Finally, the engine. It is, as you can imagine, obviously in the engine room below deck, but unlike most ships' power systems, Storm Chaser's engine requires no fuel and very little maintenance. The door should be locked and sealed for your own safety. This is by design, please keep it that way. In the very unlikely event that you need to access the engine for repairs, you can find the key in the captain's quarters above deck. But please, I cannot stress this enough, leave it alone unless you absolutely have to go in. And at that, Abasi starts to open her mouth, and so does Sing, but the queen kind of cuts in before anyone can interject. It is an experimental engine. There is nothing quite like it, but if you must know, it is made of material and it is very durable. In terms of repairs, treat it as you would any other broken thing. But again, I must reiterate, do not enter the engine room unless you absolutely have to. Just leave it be and it will serve you well. Any other non-engine related questions before we set off? No, ma'am. This is no. utterly beautiful. Thank you. You're very welcome. She is a beaut, isn't she? <laughs> you should have seen her in her heyday. None of this patina on it. Shining as bright as a brass knob in starlight. Sounds like you and she have history. Oh, well, I wouldn't say that. She's a, she's a special ship, that's all. We'll take Lumira's eyebrows, oh. <laughs> Lumira's eyebrows cocked at, at just like, hmm, okay. Thank you for your generosity. You are very welcome. And as a reminder of your objective, of course, the primary one is to find my daughter discreetly. But on the way there, it is of expedient nature that we should return Princess Sahar to the Raya so that they are not misconceived of the assumption that I have kidnapped her. Zayden just Abasi. looks at Abasi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also I think Abasi. we all just kind of cut our eyes over to Abasi, <laughs> just like... Yup. Abasi has her hands propped on her hips and is regarding Storm Chaser with like a really impressed look in her eye. And she feels all of your eyes burning into her back. She turns and says, yeah, 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 go back home. Yeah, I know, it's okay. We'll go back to my mom, my pop, and my pop. We'll explain to them that I'm totally fine and that, you know, we'll, we'll give them the information they need to hear so that we can stall any sort of conflict for as long as we need to until our merchant's back, yeah? Good. Yeah. Okay, good, excellent. Well, and Abasi claps her hands together and she like flicks out her feathered gauntlets. Even though one of them still sparks a little from being broken, she kind of shakes that one. And she gives a big flap, one, two, whoosh, up into the air, slightly rocking on the right side. Uh, she soars using a kind of like up gust of warm wind rising up from the rustling waves to then just kind of lift onto the ship itself. And once she's onto the deck, looking around, she looks a little bit smaller from like way high up. Uh, you hear her clanking around on the deck and then she lowers what appears to be a gangplank of some kind, like up and over the side of the railing, opens up a bit of the railing so there's like room for it and slides it down and it slams onto the dock so the rest of you can board. All right. We should probably make haste. We want to leave harbor before the moons rise. Right. Of course. Sarah will hang back. Oh, yeah? 
Zynan literally like stands at the bottom of the plank and like motions for everyone to go up like he's ready to go last. In that case, Sayer will quietly, his eyes kind of like darting down like like a lost child and look up at the queen and say your majesty I for what it's worth I I'm sorry <laughs> your condolences are appreciated sayer but I will do what I must for my people and Siren Song. Stay strong. I am counting on your crew to bring her back safe and sound as much as you can. We will. My daughter's fate rests in your hands. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and he'll kind of like bored uh, maybe look towards Zynan to see if Zynan heard any of that uh, but then quickly shuffle up onto the boat he wasn't not listening he uh -oh. inclines his hat to the queen and then goes up the gangplank mm. I think Sing is also she took up extended beat to look at Storm Chaser like her eyes have gone wide taking in this magnificent ship even though it's now covered in this patina it's still really beautiful in a lot of ways and her eyes are basically shining and sparkling with how lovely it is she also heard the exchange between sayer and the queen and she turns and gives the queen like a a, a, a very serious and determined nod right and says queen hylian we will do our absolute best to return your daughter to you safe and sound. You have my word. And Queen Hylian regards Sing, regards you, Sayer, these twins making the same promise. And she addresses both of you in the same breath, even as you're starting to walk up the gangplank, Sayer. And she says, just remember, the crown of power is a heavy one. Make sure all of you wear it well, with respect, with dignity, and responsibility. A final nod, the queen sees Sing, Sayer, and all of you off onto the gangplank and onto the deck of Storm Chaser itself. So up here, you see that the deck is made of broad wood, uh, these dark wooden planks that are really strong, but also flexible. And the ship is kind of rolling and pitching gently underneath your feet as you get up. That's the first thing you notice, the kind of motion at harbor, uh, a very gentle vibration from the voltaic runners buzzing upward through the broad wood to the core of your marrow, all the way up to the top of your head. It's gonna take a little minute to get used to, I think. There's a kind of magnetic woodsy smell in the air as well. Well, like electrified timber. And from up here, you can see the storm rail above your heads in full glory. These two mess massive metal prongs wrapped with copper wire that run all the way down the augmented prow, down the inner edge of the railing, all the way kind of to the back of the stern, where the wires vanish through holes drilled into the deck. They like lead somewhere below deck. You can also see the observation pole and the deck on top of it. It's a kind of basic strut mounted at the top of a very tall mast that's also wrapped in copper wire. However, these wires uh, also follow a kind of path through the deck, but they wrap themselves around the wooden spokes of this steering wheel, uh, kind of on the elevated deck by the stern instead of disappearing below deck. And as your party is taking in the surface of Storm Chaser, we see a bossy immediately heading to the steering wheel. And she's like immediately starting to flip nods and twiddle dials and like move levers and like um, pump wheels and whatnot. And the humming from the voltaic runners starts to intensify a little, buzzing a little bit more, mounting from a low hum to a medium pitched vibration. And as for Sing, she goes straight to the starboard railing, uh, leaning against it a little bit to wave goodbye to Queen Hylian Mylesia. 
And I think as your party prepares to leave, I want to know what each of you are doing to help set sail, because I, I don't think any of you have sailed a wild uh, uh, sea ship, uh, certainly not like this before. I think Lumira, when she was kind of the first one to get up onto the ship, uh, everyone was like kind of standing back uh, and <clears throat> talking to uh, Queen Hylian. And Lumira went up on deck first and kind of did like a quick purvey of the area, uh, took note of where everything was, and then her eyes locked onto the med bay and made a straight direct beeline, didn't pass go, nor collected $200. Just, just, you probably heard her pace on the ship, just like normal casual walking around, her heels clicking, and then they stop and do that frantic pace again, directly, and you just hear a door swing just like slam behind her of the med bay. And she's doing full inventory of everything. I wanna know what's in here, what's at my disposal, what can be carried on me at what time, how much we have of it, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lumira. So the, the med bay is mid deck. It's above deck, actually. It's not a chamber underneath the ship. Uh, and it's kind of in this sheltered uh, hut made of that same copper material as the rest of the hull. And it's other than that hut, there's no wall on the starboard side, at least. It's kind of open air. So you go in and immediately start flipping through cabinets and, and looking through tables and looking through uh, little doors and knobs and whatnot. And you see a bunch of like very common em emergency medicine. So there are cloth wrappings, uh, there are gauze pieces, bandages, uh, things to make tourniquets out of, splints and whatnot. You also see little bottles of what appear to be antibiotics labeled with what you assume are ailments of the wild sea. They have names like uh, woke bone sickness and like spore cloud and stuff like that. And they're like in these little vials, <laughs> like all up on a shelf above a mirror. There's also a small bench, presumably to treat people, but you get the sense that this isn't the isolation room that the queen talked about. That's probably a separate chamber below deck. Uh, Lumira, you're going off to the med bay. What about Zynan? Zynan, uh, part of the reason he was hanging back, and it becomes very clear the moment that everyone is on deck, is that while he has never been a wild sailor, he's been on a ship at least once in his life, and he saw a bossy drop the gangplank, so he goes into crewman mode and begins to haul up the gangplank uh, manually before uh, turning, taking in the ship. And before he gets even to the stern where the wheel is, he looks up at the lookout post and the storm rail and just smiles. He had been very severe coming up the gangplank, kind of following Sir. And this view, this is an adventure. We can do this. And he starts to ascend the lookout. Yeah, there are these honestly kind of rusted rungs <laughs> that lead up, 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 and they kind of scratch into your palms, but none of them break, which is probably a good sign. You ascend the observation pole and you go up to the strut at the top. It's very bare bones. There's a railing, but there's like, like, there's no wall, you know what I mean? You could dangle your legs out over the edge of this, the top of the mast, uh, but it does provide a really good vantage point up here. It's very much like the highest point of the ship by far. And you're able to see all of Siren's song kind of sprawled out before you uh, to the north and to the south, you see the Wild Sea, the Verdant Sea, this unending horizon of rolling green leaves, branches, and twigs. He takes in the verdancy it is stunning but the thing that catches his eye is that beautiful view of siren's song uh and a small blossom of hope that it gives him mm. i love that yeah i want to know what sayer is doing uh sayer kind of got up to the deck of the ship watched as everyone immediately know what place they should take and he's still kind of like 
wrestling with a discomfort deep in his chest. And then he looks up at a bossy, who is already enjoying the, the steering. And he just smirks and yells out towards a bossy. And he addresses them not as a princess, but as a peer. As he says, Getting comfortable up there, bossy! <laughs> yeah, you can count on it, Sayer. It's been a while since I've sailed one of these ships, but uh, comes back to you like learning how to ride a uh, unicycle. Right. Um. So, anchors up then, Captain. And he oh, also yeah. says that as if addressing a peer and not an actual captain. He's just <laughs> shooting the shit with with her. Totally. Yeah, Abasi actually lets out like a big full-throated laugh. <laughs> yeah, actually, anchors up. Uh, Sayer, I think it's on the starboard side. And she just kind of gestures distractedly as she's still fiddling with knobs. Heard. On my way. Uh, and you see him kind of like loosening his shoulders. This is comfortable. Lifting things, moving things, tightening things. Anything that can channel his strength somewhere mm -hmm. and he will lean towards the starboard side and pull up our heavy anchors so actually sayer as you uh -oh. approach where a bossy <laughs> had been pointing oh my lord you see what you think is an anchor system as you approach there's a, a bank of what appear to be magnets strapped to the inside of the railing as you approach they hum and lift up into the air like in response to your presence and it, to your eyes it looks really complicated there's like all kinds of runes etched onto some magnets there's a, there's also a winch with uh lengths of chain wrapped around it that's thrown over the edge presumably into the wild sea where the anchor is and you get the feeling that maybe there's a way to lift it by interacting with these magnets but also the chain is right there and you could probably just lift it physically <laughs> so are you gonna try the magnets or are you just gonna lift it I know what the people want. People. <laughs> yes. The the people the people want me to to just fucking lift this thing. So yes. we're gonna we're gonna do it. The people want me to do it. Uh, I'm gonna Sayer ask for looks a all here. <laughs> Sayer looks at all the magnets. No, no, we're not doing that. No, no. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> he is going to squat real low grab onto the chain and pull uh i would like to offer uh a i would like to offer an iron because i'm just trying uh -huh. to not fall over Sheer as i pull force. this yep. <laughs> and uh brace i think that yeah works. that makes sense go for it so that's 3d6 please <laughs> Okay, there is a six. There is a six. Thank God. Is there okay. just one six? <laughs> it's just one six. It's a six, four, and a three. Okay. Uh, Sayer, I was actually going to ask you to cut one because this thing yeah. is really it's a four. Heavy. That's okay, a four, that's, that's a conflict. That's still a success. Just a drawback. Okay. So as soon as you start pulling, holy fuck. <laughs> uh, Sayer, this thing is heavy. <laughs> it is really heavy, actually. You're like ripping it up and it seems to keep catching on something you'll get some slack and then it catches slack and then it catches but you are just like sweat starts to bead your muscles start to burn but you do it you pull the anchor up by yourself without using the mechanism uh mm -hmm. that's the success the drawback is i need you to mark one because you exert yourself pretty intensely yeah to do i'll so. i'll mark barrel chest i'm not built fancy but i am built sturdy uh my arms my deep brown skin is tinged with red. My hat, my palms are also uh, tinged with red, and I am I'm soaking from sweat from just pulling up yep. all of this hunk of metal up here. <laughs> You are. Uh, you pull an anchor, question mark, over the edge of the railing. It slams onto the deck. This thing is as big as you. Uh, and it looks less like a traditional ship anchor and more like a grappling hook with serrated edges and multiple hooks that come out. And there is what appears to be half of a tree stuck in like the serrated teeth of this grappling hook. You seem to have ripped, like uprooted some vegetation on your way of like just ripping it up uh, and hoisting it overboard. You're just dripping in sweat. 
From the stern, Abasi looks over at the big clank of the anchor, and the heaviness of the anchor actually rocks the ship a little bit onto its starboard side as it lands. And Abasi just lets out a what? Did you? Did you hoist that thing up physically? Yeah. Sayer, that thing is 2,500 pounds. I. And eat you didn't even the morning. The tea. Oh, I like you. You didn't even retract the teeth. You wanted me to do that? <laughs> oh, Zaire, I don't know what kind of a crew you were a part of before, but I have never seen anyone hoist anchor like that. Well, I, I, I can get rid of this. Um, and he kind of like looks at the little bit of whatever that's stuck onto the teeth. He's like, I, I can I can get rid of this. That way we're not tilting. Uh, just give me a second. And he's just gonna put his leg down on the thing and just pull it. Like brace it. <laughs> yeah. You have to be careful not to cut yourself on the sharp serrated edges of the hook as you're like bracing against it and pulling this tree off. I love that. Yeah. I think sticky Kreserin sap is getting all over you as you like, Go, go, go. Yeah. Pull this tree I off. imagine that Sing is also looking at me as I'm doing this, and he's just like, not a word, not a single word. I don't want to hear it. Not a word. Uh, <laughs> pull it I love that. Sing is laughing her ass off. She's like leaned over the railing and just like clutching her gut and just busting a gut. He's laughing so hard, tears are coming to her eyes. Uh, while Sayer was doing all that, uh, I think. Lumira, you hear Abasi done like laughing, ha, 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 address you now. Uh, hey, Lumira, listen, I think this thing, because it's voltaic runners, and I don't know what kind of an engine it is, but it's clearly, but it's clearly storm powered. There's going to be some sort of calibration required before we undock, which obviously necessitates a basic attunement to Arconautics, but more importantly, a strong will and a good amount of focus. So you think you could handle that? Say less, point me to it. Oh, wherever you feel comfortable. She turns and immediately goes towards that direction. <laughs> Full yeah, confidence, uh, uh, no, <laughs> no, no break in her gait at all. It's just like, yeah. I got this. Abasi had gestured kind of widely as she said, wherever you feel comfortable. And you kind of just go in the general direction of her gesturing. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of stop, I think, maybe mid deck between where the elevated storm rail is and where the med bay is. And Abasi had mentioned calibration requires a basic attunement to Arconautics, which to your learned scholar brain sounds like some calling of magic. It sounds magical in nature. So what do you do to try to calibrate the ship? Um, ooh, that's a great question. I think Lumira is an observer first, especially in new situations that she's not completely familiar with. Um, so at first it looks like she's not doing anything, just glaring at it through like slitted eyes, almost, uh, almost like she's angry at it, but she's really concentrating and she's just listening to the hum of the engine itself, trying to get a feel for when it's operating at its what she assumes to be baseline correct what it's supposed to sound like and then trying to target anything that feels mm. off like if there's like a slight sputter in a certain area if some the thing about her she loves clock gears still to this day and the thing about clock gears that makes so much sense to her is the fact that they all fit together simultaneously and work in tandem and when one of those clock gears has something stuck in it it throws off everything 
So she's listening to every little bit, every section of the engine that she can find to see if there's any type of sputtering or utterance or disturbance in what's supposed to be that mechanical gear of the ship. Mm. I really love that. I think that's going to be sharps or instinct with study, probably, or sense. Uh, 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 let's do sharps. I'm always going to do sharps. And then, yeah, okay. study as well. So that sounds be good. Three dice. Double sixes and a four. Ooh, you are doing very well. Uh, that is a triumph with a twist. So the triumph is that you're able to do it. Like you calibrate it, even though you don't really know what that means necessarily, but you figure it out, you figure it out and you do it. The twist is I'm gonna give you something extra about the way you calibrate it. So mm. you you focus and you start to just like wash everything else out, the rustling of the waves, the s sound of chatter at harbor, you know, your crewmates, uh, laughing at each other and kind of bantering on deck. You wash all of that out and you focus on the humming of the electricity in the air around you. That seems to be the motive force of Storm Chaser. There's something voltaic about it. The lightning, the electricity, the energy, the discharge. And there's something underneath the ship, within the ship, the core of it, the heart of it, the engine. That's right. Whatever Abasi had done had woken up the engine, and the engine is starting to thrum. The queen had been very roundabout about what the engine was, so all you can do is kind of feel it and hear it. And it kind of sounds like a... Like a heartbeat. Made of electricity. A pure voltaic thrumming. And something about it sounds really old. And a little arithmetic. Like it's slightly like there's it's hiccuping a bit. Like it hasn't been powered up in a really long time. And that's causing some of the electricity around you to like fritz out and discharge and like z -z 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 zap into the air, kind of uselessly wasting some energy, right? So with this focus, you're able to rein in, right? Rein in and realign these magnetic poles that are invisibly distributed all around the voltaic runners by the hull, as well as help discharge some of that latent energy that's been built up and also funnel some energy that doesn't need to be discharged and keep it within the bounds of the ship. That's kind of what calibration means. You're basically cleaning the ship and prepping it for disembarking. So what does it look like as you're pulling along the threads of this energy, or rather the magnetic forces and waves of this energy to help realign the ship? I think for Lumira, it becomes kind of like, like you said it best, like pulling on threads. It almost looks as if she's untying a ghostly knot in midair, pulling each strand apart and separating them into their own like perpendicular lines that are all kind of just running parallel to each other to where it all kind of levels out and evens to what it looks like in her mind is electromagnetic waves, kind of how they're represented to us in science now is how it's looking for her. Mm. Yeah, you get the sense that in your mind's eye, if it was kind of like a heartbeat on an EKG, it was at first mm -hmm. kind of like up and down and up and down a little erratic and you kind of steady it, right? You steady the readout. So it's swooping, calm waves that are all connected. And you also get the sense, because you got to triumph with a twist as well, that you'll probably have to do this every time you undock from a harbor because you get the sense that after a prolonged amount of time not in motion, it kind of like starts to slide out of sync. So this calibration process is important every time you undock. So Lumira, you do that perfectly with a plum in the middle of the ship, like an or orchestra director, right? Like conducting a magnum opus, right? And now I think we pan up to you, Zainan. Up at the very top of the observation deck, it's very bare bones up here. The only thing you see are a bundle of copper wires around what almost kind of looks like a satellite dish, but really small, maybe the size of just a plate, like a dinner plate at most, kind of resting against one of the uh, railings, one of the poles of the railing. And coming out of this dish, you hear a bossy's voice, but in a kind of compressed tinny way. 
from the steering wheel. So she doesn't have to like shout all the way up at you and be like fight to be heard over the gusting gales. Hey, uh, Zynan, you up there? Can you hear me? Is this thing working? I got you. Hi. Excellent. Okay, since you're going to be on watch, I need you to help me navigate out of harbor so I don't ram anyone. I'm kind of sailing without sight here. I got you. Uh, and he looks around, kind of realizing he actually doesn't even know how this thing moves. If it's like floating, if it drives like a ship, like he's like realizing that he's up here and going, I actually don't even know what I'm looking for, but I have eyes, so I'm gonna look with them. Uh, and he does get more comfortable up there and delayers a little bit because it's it took it took climbing. He's listen. Underneath all of that, he uh, is wearing just a heavy duster and a jacket underneath it, and he takes his long wrap off and kind of knots it to the side um, and uses it as a loop to just hold on to the, the lookout post uh, and starts to survey whatever movement might be happening. <laughs> Sure. So you're on top, you're looking around. Uh, why don't you roll to see if you can spot any hazards that might be hidden to Abasi as she's down there? All right. So what edge would you be utilizing here? I'm thinking either like instinct probably or tides. I was going to go with for tides. Yeah, tides make sense. That's for exploration, learning, and lore. So what skill are you using here? Sense. We're going to make sense. look with those big, bright green eyes. Roll for it. See, I think Sam is stealing my good rolls. Um, I did okay. I did okay. But I did get a twist and a five. Oh, a five. That's not bad. Okay, that's yeah, a conflict. No, we're good. Conflict we're with good. a setback. Okay, yep. With a twist. As you cast your gaze around, you're not the only ship docked at harbor. You're also not the only ship trying to come out of harbor or come into it. This is kind of like a busy port. And even though the sun is starting to dip underneath the washed green horizon, it's still pretty busy. You reckon the busyness might drop in a couple of hours, but this is kind of like prime time for evening traffic here by the harbor. There's lots of ships pulling in and out. You see ships that are just barely large enough to fit like two or three people. You see other ships that are about the same as yours. Uh, your boat seems to be standard size, right? And then a couple of ships that are significantly bigger, right? Like really big ships that seem to be for like merchants, like big cargo ships. Uh, and also ships that seem to have outriders uh, next to them, kind of almost like an escort service, right? To like flank on either side of the ship, uh, almost like jet skis on the side of like a, a larger boat or vessel. Uh, the kinds of ships you see are so diverse in make and model. There are ones with like broad wood hulls and bites made of these ripping chainsaws that just kind of grrr and like cut through the wild sea. They kind of like coast and bubble and froth on top of the waves and like hit down and they go up and then hit down and they go up. There are also ships where their bites are less bites and more just like um, they almost look like claws that come out and help them skitter uh, on top of on top of the waves, like centipedal legs. You also see ships that are just cut from a single plank of wood, right? And there's ba barely any siding. It just kind of like floats and skiffs on top of the waves. So all kinds of ships, all kinds of vessels, all kinds of boats and people manning them out here. With your success with a drawback, you do see kind of Abasi starting to back Storm Chaser out of harbor now that the anchor has been lifted and it starts to drift away from the dock. In kind of her blind spot directly behind her, you see another ship that is slightly smaller than Storm Chaser kind of cutting perpendicularly. And if she keeps going at the same rate of motion, and if that ship also keeps going at the same rate of motion, they're gonna collide into each other in a T shape. Uh, yeah, he, uh, to your starboard. Mm. Uh, Abasi immediately, uh, just kind of goes, oh, uh, shit, okay, yeah, uh, how do I stop? Ah, uh, uh, Voltaic runners, Voltaic runners, I have to, uh, this thing. And then she slams a button, uh, and all the magnets just kind of let out a, and, like, kind of stops the ship, like, dead in its tracks, as all the magnets just click into the hull. And the other ship just, like, goes right past 
They don't even seem to have noticed. Uh, and Zayden, you see there's no one up on their observation deck, and there's a bunch of people on the deck just, like, partying and talking to Zayden each other. Like, it's... Yeah. <laughs> annoyedly whistles down at them. Uh, hey! Watch where you're going! Uh, I think your voice floats down to them. Maybe a couple of them hear you, but most of them just continue going on partying as it like continues to circle the base of this mountain, the base of this island siren song, right? Just kind of floats out of the way. And Zynan, I think the drawback is that you're kind of annoyed now. I don't think yeah. you're in a great mood. No. Yeah, especially because you have such an important mission to hold that it's kind of ridiculous to you that there are people out here who just seem to be like devil may care, not a care in the world, partying on a boat. That boat could have been used to help look for Amargin or do something more important than just be a boat filled with people making merry, right? Like some of this annoyance coming up, people not even noticing where they're going, it starts to bubble up and, and sour your mood. Uh, at this point, you're starting to really pull out from the dock now. And from the harbor, uh, we see these voltaic runners spark and crackle with the electricity as Abasi starts to uh, put the ship in motion again. And this array of magnets snaps outward once more, and Storm Chaser lifts even higher off the surface of the Verdancy. And with this great big electrical whine, uh, it fully begins humming off toward the rustling leaves laid out before you in a viridescent ocean. And all of you from where you're at can see Queen Hylian Mylesia, the ruler of Siren Song, waving farewell to your party from shore. And she is by herself, she is regal and poised, with just the slightest nod of worry on her forehead. And as she gets smaller and smaller and smaller, all of you can't help but notice how lonely she looks, all by herself, carrying the burdens of an entire reach on her shoulders. And then, with another great big hum of energy, Storm Chaser crests over this small hill of leaves, and Queen Hylian dips out of sight. Your party had set out pretty late in the day. At this point, the sun is heading toward the horizon and the sky is slowly but very surely turning dark. In just a few hours, night will come. But it hasn't come yet. And up here on the deck, the weather is fair, the breeze is balmy, and the smell of the air is earthy with just the barest whiff of sweet pollen. Everywhere you look, you see vegetation. Moving, roiling, breathing vegetation, a literal sea of it before you for miles and miles and miles and miles. And it's not just treetops and canopy, either. You see branches, leaves, vines, and bright coral-like clusters of flowers. There is something so freeing about being out here, something so wild and beautiful and vast. It's almost beautiful enough to make you all forget about the blue fire that nearly destroyed the soul shank vines. It's almost lovely enough to make you forget who you really are. And as the hours tick by, I want to know what each of you are doing aboard this ship, starting with Lumira. Lumira probably has made her way back up to the med bay. Um, more specifically than anything, at least the door is open now that she's made, uh, all, she's took an inventory of, of everything. Um, and I think what she probably does is immediately gets to remake or starting to make more of her healing pulses, uh, We'll probably be over here for a while. I can probably make a bit. Uh, it'll, and clearly the way things are going, um, it's definitely going to be useful. Uh, and I need it. So that's mm. what she's doing at the time. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. I think you're sitting there for like a while, kind of like making these healing poultices, taking stock, taking inventory of what's in the med bay. Absolutely. What about you, Sarah? 
I think after kind of like speaking to Abasi for a while and seeing the state of the ship, Sayer goes towards the um, the Voltaic runners, anywhere that kind of just has uh, the like the storm rail, anywhere that has uh, wires that lead below that are kind of worse for wear than uh, brand new. And he kind of takes on the responsibility to maybe wrap up some of any exposed wire that is uh, aboard the ship and takes very good care because he has an affinity for electricity, for lightning and voltage that every few minutes, if there's a, a stray bolt, he catches it and um, just takes just takes the pain uh, as he continues to wrap these wires together. Mm. Sayer, so, yeah, there are a ton of wires. There's probably like a couple hundred feet, if not more, of wiring in total on this ship. Some of it might even be invisible to you, like inside the walls of the ship itself. But it, you begin the work, and so much of it is poorly insulated. Like, the weather and time has not been kind to this copper wiring. Very little of it actually has any kind of covering over it. So I think you're using some scrap you find around or just stuff on your person mm -hmm. to help insulate, but you're gonna run out of rubber and proper insulation soon. You're probably gonna have to restock the next time you dock, if, if at all, if you wanna finish this project. Any type of busy work to mm. get my mind away from fire, from my failure. There's no I in team, but there's I in failure. There's no I in team, but there's I in failure. Ouch! Yeah! Sayer, as we find you maybe kind of at the base of the prow, which is kind of elevated onto a higher level, maybe wrapping some insulation around a dangling piece of wire, you hear kind of like a bubbling laugh by the steering wheel, and you see your sister, Sing, kind of leaning against this bank of navigational consoles next to Abasi, and she's like talking and laughing her usual Sing way to Abasi, who's also kind of laughing back and just occasionally nudging the wheel to keep on, keep on course. And you get the sense that like, Abasi is showing Sing how to do the thing, you know, Sing kind of like leans in a little too close and ha puts like a hand on Abasi's shoulder, looking at the navigation, like a an inquisitive look coming over their face, you know, and then Abasi looks like very instructional, you know, and like guides Sing's hand and Sing's already laughing and getting along and so easy going and like so carefree, you know, it's like the blue flame isn't even a spark in her mind. It's like she's completely unburdened by it, or at least that's how she appears. Right, as she's just with Abasi laughing and doing the thing by the steerage. Of course. Of course she is. Of course. And he just kind of like looks up at her, the blue eyes of his glinting in the last remnants of the setting sun. It sighs very heavily, shakes his head, and continues his busy work. The sparks mm. probably stinging him more this time. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to shut out Sing going, Oh, oh, I know what that thing is. Um, That's a barometer, right? For air pressure? Yeah, yeah, that's a barometer. I mean, obviously, it's pretty common knowledge if you're a wild sailor, but uh, yeah. Well, this one's actually an older model. I think that's an X1390. Oh, really? You know, I prefer the X1392. Oh, yeah? You into antiques too? And like, it's really hard to shut out this banter. <laughs> by the stern, it just carries on the wind and drifts right by you. And I think it also carries on the wind and drifts by Zynan, right? Who I assume for a while has still been up on that observation deck. But what are you up to now in these hours that pass? I think once we got clear of Siren Song and there were less ships that were freeloading nearby, uh, <laughs> the Fury doesn't leave, and it morphs from frustration at these people who were carefree in the face of apocalypse. How could they just live their lives like 300 years ago the world didn't end? And it bites at him and morphs and grows from an ember to a flame. And 
it rolls around and rolls around. But he also remembers the conversation he had with Singh and the kindness and mentorship and Artemis's words that never really leave his head to keep an eye on her, look out for her. And thus look out for the whole strike team. And so as the sun dwindles, he unwraps his scarf and uh, climbs down from the lookout onto the deck and lets out a very high-pitched whistle, um, just trying to get everyone's attention. Uh, we should, we should talk about what happened at the palace, if you don't mind, maybe before dinner. At the whistle, Lumera comes out, of course, just a little bit after, sidetracked, uh, consistently not on time, um, and... She walks out and goes, all right, Pop, well, I've took inventory of everything uh, as well as gotten the engine to hum the way it needs to. I'll probably have to do that every time we stop the ship for any period of time. Did you, you wanted something, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wanted to uh, go over what our objectives are and some cover some bases duly noted and she walks over into formation stock still back shoulders straight eyes on you sayer's heart sinks and he puts down the wires he puts down the rubber and he stands up finally it's here, the reckoning. It's here. It'll happen and it'll end. It'll happen and it'll end. And he's rubbing his hands, uh, the tips of his fingers still red and stinging from the static and the voltage of the wires that he was working on. He quietly slinks into the group um, and gives Zynan a nod as he stands, shoulders hunched. With the nod, all Zynan can think about is the queen saying, remember that things have repercussions, actions have consequences. And he just hears it over and over and over again. And that bad mood just turns in him. He looks up to sing just to see, but I think before he gets all the way into like kindly inviting her down, he just sees a bolt of that voltaic energy and it paints his face for just that little instant. We need to talk about keeping our heads in sticky situations and how that can jeopardize our, uh, our mission here. I understand. Yeah, we should talk. And as he says that, he, his eyes are darting around. And then finally, his hand still shaking in his own grip. Looks directly into your green eyes, Zynan. Like he's rising to meet this challenge. Mm -hmm. And Zynan steps forward. You need to learn to keep your head to be frank because mm. that was dangerous the Kreserin burns whoa 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 hold on hold on Zynan with all due respect I do not think that this is the time nor place for this conversation no no let him let him speak he clearly has something he wants to say to me, so Zainan, yes, please, say it to me. This is not the place or time. 
what is the right place or time, Lumira? And Sayer just pivots straight towards Lumira. Lumira kind of steps we, back a sec. We haven't talked about anything that has gone wrong. We haven't talked about this. We're not talking about this. We haven't talked about 609-34-114 or Earth. We, we have to talk about this clearly because it's bothering everyone. So let's just let it all out, right? Right here, right now. There is nothing to talk about, Sayer. And Lumira's eyes are directly focused on you. Nothing to talk about? It what happened. It happened. I fucked up, right? I know that. I know that I fucked up, but it sucks when no one wants to talk about it and just say how they actually feel. How you actually feel. Why are Don't you even put defending words in my me? mouth? Why why are you even defending me? I I saw that look. You You're frightened of me too. Don't ever tell me what I am. I don't feel any different about Earth because I don't see you any different since Earth. Sarah but you I clearly know. have problems, so please air them out, Sayer. Sarah's eyes narrow at you. This, there's a, a look, a flicker of questioning, of interrogation, as he kind of like leans in more to this conflict and he says you don't feel any different no you ran away lumira you pulled away at the observatory right you don't feel anything about it that's the most blatant lie i've ever heard don't ever call me a liar don't forget, I am not the only one that pulled away in the observatory. Sayer, if we want to have this conversation now in front of everyone, we can. I never got the chance to explain. Explain what? You left from, I opened up to you. And her eyes, what once were marble like opalescent are now dark, stormy gray. You see the images of that same blue fire in her pupils. Sayer's eyes meet yours in that flame and there is a electric lightning spark that has just been set off. Not misrepresent you, not call you a liar. What are, what are we going to talk about the fact that you went off to training, right? You got signed up to your brand new shining strike team Phoenix and you abandoned me, Lumira. You haven't spoken to me in years until you joined strike team Nova. What about that? Or even, or even better than that, you joined your brand new shining little strike team and you were on a team with Cove. Cove, the person I nearly eviscerated with my flame. And you said nothing? Cove is the biggest loudmouth of trans I ever fucking knew. And you said nothing about that? Lumera takes a couple extra steps back at Strike Team Phoenix, but then leans forward, her eyes Fiery. <sighs> Cove never mentioned anything that happened between the two of you. But I love to know what you really think of me, Sayer. Thank you. Genuinely. Do you know what I really think, Lumira? I think that we're an entire team 
that hides underneath layers and layers of shadow, hoping, hoping nothing ever comes up. We tell each other to just not do things, not touch things, <laughs> but things happen. Right, Lumira? Just like Strike Team Phoenix. Things happen, you abandon them, like you will abandon me, and just... You're just making everything worse, Lumira. The fire that you saw cracks. It physically appears in the marble that she is made of now, directly diagonal across the face. And she will <sighs> roll her shoulders back and give you one last fiery glare, but those eyes are glazed over in tears, but she will not give you the satisfaction of letting them fall in front of you or anyone. And she will turn and walk directly below ship. Will not say another word. Checking in above table. How are you doing, Sam? Doing. How are you, my love? I'm good. Uh, adore you. Love you very much. Love you. Uh, let me. Love you. Let me know if you need anything from me. Absolutely. Same here. Doing good. Thank you, babe. No worries. Uh, Sayer watches Lumira leave, walking away from him. And there's a glint in his mind's eye of a sudden abrupt pulling away of bright silver eyes turning away from him of the glint of gold shying away back into shadow under the glint of moonlight. It wasn't supposed to be like this. And Sarah holds his face in his hand but the anger has not boiled over yet. Where's with your Zion face, in all of this? <laughs> with your face in your hand, you hear after Lumira's footsteps echo and vanish below deck. The sound of thunk, thunk, thunk as Zynan begins to ascend the lookout post again, not daring to intervene in that. <laughs> Sayer kind of watches Zynan walk off back below deck and glances over at the other witnesses to all this. What expressions do they wear? A bossy heard and saw everything by the steering wheel. Her hands had stilled on the wheel, but as soon as the argument was over, they blink and flinch and look down and they go oh, oh shit and they quickly turn the wheel like in one direction to get back on course and they kind of <clears throat> cough and glance over at Singh who glances back at Abasi puts a hand on Abasi's shoulder and then kind of like comes down the steps uh, from the stern in your direction Sayer and it looks like they're approaching you like your twin is coming over to you to say something, to do something, right? Uh, and do your eyes rise to meet her at all? He turns away. He raises an arm and he just says, shows over, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk later. And he'll march off after Zynan. Which, <laughs> just as well, because Singh wasn't going over to talk to you, Sayer. She walks straight past you doesn't even acknowledge you, doesn't say anything, doesn't look at you. Even as you raise your arm, there is no acknowledgement from your twin. Sing goes straight toward the ladder below deck to look for Lumira. Sayer's heart sinks even deeper into his chest and there is such fire, such heat that it feels like it's just going to burn up all of his insides as he marches, holding back 
vicious, vicious tears, uh, and tries to look for Zynan below deck. Because this he is isn't over. Deck. He's above you deck. You saw him Sorry. climb the ladder. Yep. <laughs> Sayer will climb the rickety, rusty ladder, not caring that the rust paints his hands, stings him. And as he gets to the top of the observation deck, he stares at Sinan for a heartbeat. Uh, when you crest the top, Sinan is gripping the rail, the, the like one place that he can actually secure himself. And you can see that the creases in his gloves are firm. He is white knuckling on this. What is your problem with me, sir? Respectfully. <laughs> you, you have to stop calling me, sir. <laughs> then what, what should I call you, Zainan? You're an authority figure here. You are the agent here with the most experience. <laughs> then why don't what? you listen to me? If I have so much experience, why don't you listen to me when I say you should use your head? Listen to you? Zainan, all you and anyone else ever tells me, here or in trance, is, Hey Sayer, don't do that. Hey Sayer, don't blast things. Hey Sayer, don't touch that. I can't do that, Zainan. It's a power in me. If I don't do it, doesn't mean it disappears. It's still there. How the hell am I supposed to wield a weapon if I don't even know how to use it? It's really hard to wield a weapon when you're not looking at where you're aiming. If you're just swinging wildly, you'd be lucky if you hit anything. Actions have consequences. You swing your weapon, you could hit innocence. You could burn down the gate of the palace. Sayer's eyes in most of your interaction are like flitting wildly and then you mention missing marks and missing aim and Zainan I think you, you've never seen this, this turn before as if something held back has poured out now and he says we handled it okay I we Stopped the blaze, and I've had this worse time, blazes than trance. That is not an encouraging thought. Actions have consequences. You set one fire here, you could put all of this, and he points across the verdancy in danger. And then where are those people going to be? You want to send another planet-wide mayday call? You got to think, and you got to use what i know is in there because you cannot just swing you have to think through what you are gonna do the reason people keep on telling you to stop and no is because you don't teach a caged animal by tying them down you set up boundaries a good warrior can just run free and find the edges There's a, a really heavy silence as Sayer looks out to the Wild Sea when Zainan points. I think he feels something. A pull, a tug of burning, of destruction, of calamity. And something like clicks in his head as you look Zynan doesn't look out at the verdancy he soaks in Sayer's features and all of that rage is suddenly at odds with how much you look like Sing and that conversation and the hurt in her eyes comes rushing back and all he can feel is 
wanting to save the princess and stop the queen from having that look in her eyes that we just sailed away from to stop Sing from feeling the weight of all of the multiverse on her shoulders. And he cools. Sir. I don't know how, okay? <laughs> he he turns away, hiding the th thread of tears. I, I don't know how. Hey, I need help. Sir. We're gonna do it together. I'm not going anywhere. And I think you see it as he turns to face you, hair, his dark curls gripped around his desperate hands, and the glint of a tear that has already fallen past his cheek. Why don't, uh, why don't you take look out for a while? Get some air. Yes, I know. Seer. Can't scare me away. And he lowers himself down the ladder. Sayer sits there, staring out into the vast beauty of the Wild Sea. Still verdant. Not burnt. You good, Val? I'm good. Thank you for checking in. I'm good. Green's over here. Humira, where below deck have you gone to? Lumira, she finds her quarters specifically, I think, and walks frantically to her room door and slams it shut behind her. And I think with a quick, brief look around of the room to make sure that it was empty, she finally closes the door and locks it and just kind of like turns around and presses her back against it. And for what it's worth, for all appearances that she holds, the thing that's most important is maintaining that whatever it is, that, that stoicness, that cut-offness that is needed to work in trans and she's perfected the silent cry has since she was very young so she just finally slides and like slams her back up against it and slides down to the floor uh and much like when she was young she finds solace in the grounding of the floor underneath her and the wall against her back. And she just kind of curls into herself, wraps her arms around her knees and just cries. Not a word, not a peep, not a sound. If anything, the only sound you probably could hear would be like teardrops hitting the wood floor. But even that is kind of drowned out by the waves crashing against the hull of the ship. Lumira, you hear footsteps coming down the hallway and then they pause in front of your door. And you hear Sing's voice coming through, muffled by a couple inches of broadwood. Lulu? Sing, not... Not now. Uh, it's okay, you don't have to open the door. Uh, I just, um, I just wanted to say that I, 
I don't think he's angry at you, Lulu. Honestly, I think he's angry at me. And and that doesn't make what they said right. But I'm so sorry it was directed at you. It should it should have been me. No one and she gets ready to say something but bites her tongue swallows it and kind of leans her head back up against the door releases herself from the ball I was the only one who stood up for him and this is how he treats me Everyone else has been riding his ass since Earth, and I am the only one. The only one. He says he, I abandoned him, but he abandoned me. Sing. Lumira, trust me when I say this, that being close to Seir can be... Well, my, my brother is a... He's a sword, you know? Cuts both ways. And it can be hard, I think, to be around him when you don't when you don't, when he... And Sing kind of trails off, like she's butting up against so many different things within her own mouth right now, trying to find the right things to say that usually come to her so fluidly. She pauses, reassesses, goes on to say, what he said about you, Lumira, is not true. You don't make things worse. He's just lashing out. Lulu, listen to me. You make things better. You're a healer. A damn good healer. And not just, like, a trans healer. You know, like, it's your role. Like, it's what you have to do. You, you know, you, 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 you touch people. You, you make them better. You make me better. He was just saying that because he was angry and lashing out, and I know that's not fair, and he shouldn't have said it, but my brother lashes out all the time, Lumira, and at this point I've gotten used to it, and I I know how to hold that. And I'm so sorry, I I, I should have been there to catch it. Saying You don't have to apologize for the truth. I... I don't... I understand what he thinks now about me if there is anything I've learned it is that some some anger comes from a nugget of truth so I know what he thinks and what he feels around me. And what he said was the truth. But I would never hit him as low as he hit me. Lumira, 
I... I love my brother so much. I love Seir so much. So much. More than I... More, more than I think I know how. What he said to you was out of anger, and maybe it came from a place of hidden resentment or something, but you have to know that it's not just anger that he holds, okay? And for what it's worth, Lumira, I, I care about you so much. So much, Lulu, and I know we haven't been as close as we used to, I'm glad we stayed in contact a little bit over the years as you went off to Phoenix and Sayer and I did the shadowing thing. But I don't think I ever really truly expressed to you just how happy and grateful and excited I am to be on the same strike team as you. I really want it to just feel like the good old days again, you know? You and me just doing fun things, going on adventures, running around the syndicate. And getting in Lulu. trouble with Artemis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> getting in trouble with Artemis and then getting out of it. Uh, Lulu, I... I'll never leave you. You know that, right? I'll never hit you anywhere. You, you mean too much to me. I would do anything for you, Sing. You know that, right? Would you open up the store? And uh, Lumira will stand, wipe her face, fix herself, and open the door. And Sing comes in. Say her. Up on the deck, I think you've had some time to recollect yourself. I think some time passes, right? Mm. Uh, you're not necessarily up on the observation deck anymore. You are wherever you would like to be. So where do we kind of find you? I think in a moment of quiet introspection, right? Or, or a moment where you've had some time to yourself to think after that moment you shared with Zynan. Sayer is in his quarters. I think there was a word exchanged to Abasi that he has done his duty that he'll retire. And they are sat lying down upon the bed. His arm crossed over his eyes, and right by his other arm is a opened journal with some handful of writings in it and a furious sketch of a monster. And he's just leaning into the softness of this bed, eyes closed. In the last throes of sobbing, probably, but all that's left is heaving. Sayer, there's knocking at your door, a familiar knocking, you already know who it is, and your twin on the outside says, Sayer, can you come out here for a moment? There's something I want to show you. Sing, if this is another funny animal that you have found on the branches of the wild sea, I don't... I... Okay, well, there are two things I want to show you, then. And his sigh is so loud and audible. It even... It's loud enough to hear through the door. And I think Sing hears the creaking of the bed as he gets up and shuffles over to the door and opens it and just says, I'm not going to be the one to smuggle it to Artemis. 
and just kind of looks at Sink. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sink interrupts you immediately by grabbing your wrist and pulling you. Like, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. Down the hallway, <laughs> up, like, the ladder, up the stairs to above deck, where as soon as you poke your heads out, this, like, really nice evening slash night breeze gusts over and across the railing, and you can hear the rustling of the leaves all around you, and it's nighttime. It is fully night now, past to dusk, right? The sky is dark, and there are two moons in the sky, twin moons that have inverted uh, phases across each other. They're both kind of currently curved into this crescent direction and facing each other, they almost look like horns, right? From where the dark of the moon cuts into them. And Sing actually grabs your wrist. There's a moment as both of you take in the moons and then she kind of pulls you toward the base of the observation deck where uh, she says, I convinced Zainan to let us have the deck for a second. Come on. And she starts climbing it. Uh, oh, okay. I think his eyes are still like caught by the moons for a second, but he complies. He kind of like steals himself a little bit, trying to get the last of the sobs out and uh, climbs up to the observation deck. Yeah, as you do, uh, they kind of scoot to the side so both of you can sit on this little platform. There's just enough room, barely enough room for two people to fit up here. And she grins over at you, right? Their pink eyes glowing in this like low light of the twin moons. And the first thing they do is they show you something in their hand that they scoop out of their pocket. And you see what appears to be a little animal. It is a little snail, but the shell is kind of crusted over with little chunks of rusted algae. So mm -hmm. here's the freaky animal. Apparently, Abasi said that it's called a shriek shell. They're kind of like barnacles, and they like to, you know, clam onto the edges of holes. And I tried to scrape this one off, but if you're a little too harsh with it, well... And then she pokes it, and it lets out a horrifying, high-pitched squealing. We're not bringing that back to trance. We're not bringing that back to trance. I think it's kind of cute. You know, it screams when it's, you know, being annoyed or inconvenienced in any way, which, honestly, same. And she puts it back in her pocket. <laughs> he, he does laugh at that um, and leans against probably the mast of the observation mm -hmm. deck so that she has more room. Because Sing takes up so much space in whatever place that she's in. And she he's does. just learned to know <laughs> how to subconsciously lean back so she has more space to bounce around and be excited yeah and... she does take sorry go ahead no he's and he's just like listening he's just looking at her and just listening sing does take up more room than you usually but here she seems conscious of that fact and after her little bout of like giddiness about the shriek shell she turns to you and kind of like closes herself up a little bit more so you get to have a bit more room next to her by the mast as well and Sing goes on to gesture at the moons above your head. That's the thing she wanted to show you. And as both of you look up at these beautiful, I think, pale celestial bodies, Sing says to you, her pink eyes still focus on the moons, but her words addressing you. We're both under a lot of pressure right now. You know? I've got my destiny, and you've got all your power. That you've always had. Yeah, my bullshit, fiery, monstrous power. Yeah, it's that's what not I have. bullshit, fiery, monstery power, Sayer. It's just everyone says that what you have is dangerous. That it, it, it's threatening. It's violent. And yeah, sure, maybe, but I, I don't know, Sayer. Deep in my gut, it just feels like. And she turns to look at you, cutting herself off. And her eyes are fixed on your ice blue ones completely now. Everyone assumes it was me who helped you calm the blue fire back at the gate. Everyone assumes that it's me who helps you just generally. But the truth is, we help each other. I can't do this without you, Sayer. I need you. Sayer looks up at the moon's glistening, and as the ship continues to move, the shadow moves past his face before the light greets it again. You really believe that? 
Really? 100%. As sure as fate. Never gonna abandon you, Sing. I'm your brother, right? And I'm your sister, Doofus. Never gonna abandon you either. We came into the journey together. We're gonna travel it together. He holds up a fist for Sing to boop as well. Yeah, she boops it. Together then. Just like the moons. They're better together too, aren't they? They are. They really are. And for a moment, Sayer allows himself to believe that they both rise and phase together. Behold on that scene with these two twins silhouetted by the bright light of the crescent moons in the night sky above them. And as the three of you finally drift off into sleep on your first night in the wild sea, after a long, turbulent day, you dream. Well, dream might not be the right word. All of you have a nightmare. The same nightmare. And we're going to end the session there. Uh, so thank you everyone so much for tuning in to this week's stream of the Chaos Protocol over here on Transplaner RPG. No, run at back. No, run no, at no, back. No, 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 God, each other. I'm just gonna ignore you all, and I'm just gonna keep doing the outro tech shit because I'm evil like that. Uh, you can find me across the internet at by Connie Chang, B Y C O N I C H A N G, uh, on TikTok and Twitter. Namely, I'm gonna pass along outro tech shits over to Valiant Dorian. Hello, everybody. I am Valiant. Love is not winning today, Dorian. I use he and his pronouns. You can find me all around the internet at Valiant Dorian and at Otso Spirit. Please enjoy that lovely treasure I just set you on. And tonight I played your misbeloved, monstrous, furious, vicious twin, Seir, who uses he, they pronouns. And I'm going to pass introductions over to Kai. Oh, I'm so honored. Uh <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Kai. I use he, they, and she pronouns. You can find me on all social media platforms as Estelle of Imladris, and I have just had a whew, good old time playing Zainan Esh this lovely evening and uh, getting some stuff off of our chests. Uh, I'm gonna bump it over to the completely immaculate Sam. Kai, I love you so much. What if I just told you I loved you consistently all the time? Uh, hello everyone, uh, I am Sam Star. I use she, they, and the occasional fey pronouns, and you can catch me all over the interwebs at Lust for Life X. And tonight I had the pleasure and also emotional displeasure of playing a healer who just tries to do right, but everyone just pushes her left anyway. Uh, Lumira who uses she her pronouns and i'm going to uh toss the light back on over to the boss it's me the boss uh so before we uh shut out for the evening two really quick things so as a reminder we are nominated for best podcast in the annies uh that's right so it would mean so much to us if you took a little bit of time right now just a couple of minutes literally not even like 30 seconds uh to toss us a vote to support trans and queer art by people of color in the ttrpg space the wild crpg is also up for an any under best writing so please go support the system that we're using for arc one of the chaos protocol as well so use exclamation point any to go show your support for transplaner under best 
best podcast. The other important thing is we are taking next weekend off from the Chaos Protocol. So no Chaos Protocol stream next Saturday due to some scheduling conflicts that we knew about way in advance. So instead, there's still going to be a stream, though. I'm going to be doing a very special Q&A stream about Transplaner and the Chaos Protocol to help raise funds for our cast to get to Big Bad Con. That's right. We're trying to pay everyone to get to Big Bad Con uh, this uh, this this fall, so everyone yeah, just later can go and, and, and show up in our live show. So tune in next Saturday, July 22nd at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time to support our crowdfunding effort and ask whatever questions you'd like about the channel and the show. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, so much for tuning in. Stick around for the raid that I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing with our lovely producer. And we'll see you next week, Saturday, July 22nd at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time for our Q&A session. Peace out, peace out.